gives me a great pleasure to present Dr. Roxana Maran, who is the Director of Interventional uh, Cardiovascular Research and Clinical Trials at Mount Sinai Heart, uh, and the topic, which is so in flux. Every other day, we get some new trials showing one versus other. So I ask uh, uh, Roxana to present on the evolving paradigm of antiplatelet, antithrombotic therapy post PCI. That what we need to know as a simple way that uh, the, that what they should be doing, how things are changing, recommendations are being changing, and of course she's a, a PI of a major trial which will uh, change our guidelines. Uh, uh, and of course she'll mention about that. With that note, Roxana, the stage is yours. Thank you, Dr. Sharma, ladies and gentlemen. It really is an honor to be here with you tonight. And I, I sent a little note to all of you, welcoming you all, and I look forward to your questions. Dr. Sharma asked me for 15 minutes to talk about antiplatelet and antithrombotic therapy after PCI. Important for you to note all of my disclosures. This is everything for myself and my spouse, but also please note that um, the Twilight study, which I will be mentioning today, for which I was the global PI for, was uh, conducted at Mount Sinai, sponsored by Icahn School of Medicine at Mount Sinai through a grant from AstraZeneca. So the cornerstone of what it is that we do during the time of PCI is the use of antithrombotic and antiplatelet agents. And I've sort of splashed them up on the screen here from, uh, from Jean-Pierre uh, uh, Jean Collet, who has done a beautiful, beautiful review on this uh, just this year about the, the fact that so much is involved here in, on the antiplatelet and on the anticoagulation side that we are using specifically in the cath lab with the use of unfractionated heparin by valerudin. And uh, we no longer are using low molecular weight heparin as much as we used to in the past. And fundaparinox never came to, uh, to use here in the United States. But in our patients with atrial fibrillation, we are now using factor 10A inhibitors, direct uh, oral anticoagulants. And we often have you uh, manage your patients. As you know, Dr. Sharma works very, very closely with each and every one of you to manage the patients the way you want to manage them. And of course, the uh, antiplatelet drugs uh, are clopidogrel uh, for the mainstay, but now we have uh, the more potent agents, prasugrel, ticagrelor, but we also in the lab use intravenous cangrelor, which is a P2Y12 inhibitor with a very quick onset offset action intravenously. And then at times we have used glycoprotein 2B3A inhibitors. The fact of the matter is that the drug of choice of what antiplatelet, antithrombotic has a lot of issues about what kind of a patient are we talking about? Number one, um, is there what the comorbidities are? What's going on in the procedure? What kind of a procedure on those extrinsic factors? And really kind of coming to this ischemic and bleeding risk balance that we make important decisions. And as long as stents have been around, antiplatelet therapy has been the cornerstone. Initially, it was thought actually with angioplasty that you could reduce small muscle cell proliferation and work towards restenosis. But really, the truth is that it's about the platelet and coagulation pathways, especially because of the blood flow reduction around the scaffold, uh, where especially around the thicker struts as well as the formation of thrombus around the, um, the stent and the stent struts. The guidelines have been extremely clear about what to do, where I've put both the ACC and the ESC guidelines here. And between stable and acute coronary syndromes, it's really important to evaluate the risk of bleeding, whether you're in US or Europe, it's really about that bleeding risk. And when the bleeding risk is low, you start to see these arrows going as, as, as high up as 30 months because you want to give them the protection. Even in stable disease, the protection for non-stent related complications. But when there is high bleeding risk, that's when we begin to shorten the duration of DAPT, de-escalate the treatment from, let's say, a potent agent to a lesser or drop one of the, uh, or drop aspirin. And we'll talk about those. 
But the evidence around the high bleeding risk with the shortened duration of DAP is extremely low. Take a look at the, it's usually orange. You're not seeing green bars here. And it's really about the bleeding and why bleeding matters so much. About a decade ago, I did this study looking at the acuity trial with Greg Stone, and we looked at the influence of bleeding and am I in the first 30 days on risk of death after a year, up to a year. So how does early events, major bleeding or MI, impact late mortality at one year? 14,000 patients. We had 524 of these patients who died. And you can see the attribution of the deaths after a myocardial infarction or after major bleeding is similar. So if you were to just say, I only want to prevent myocardial infarction, then you're not paying attention to an important complication such as bleeding. They're both important. Well, then how do you, how do you manage this? How do you navigate this? In fact, the um, Marco Valgemigli looked at the tracer trial. And when you get to this level of bleeding of bark 3 c and more, it's way more important than uh, spontaneous myocardial infarction. These are the bleeds we cannot tolerate. And we work really hard to look for the patients who might have these bleeds and shorten the duration of that because of it. Because both MI and bleeding are exactly important. Bleeding BARC3, MI, spontaneous myocardial infarction, both have the same hazard on one year mortality. Bleeding matters because so many things happen after a patient bleeds. Well, there's that early um, hemoglobin drop, decreased oxygen delivery that could lead to uh, bleeding-related deaths. But then when a patient bleeds, the first thing you do, you stop their dual antiplatelet therapies. These are life-saving medication. There's rebound platelet reactivity. And if you have a fresh stent with incomplete stent endothelialization, guess what you end up with? Stent thrombosis and myocardial infarction. And of course, when there's a transfusion, we do know that there is inflammatory activation, vasoconstriction, and platelet aggregation associated with transfusion. All of these actually leading to ischemic events. So it's bleeding that then begets an ischemic event. Isn't that interesting? Well, so much has happened from first-generation DES and up to what it is that we do every day in our cath lab with Dr. Sharma and Dr. Kinney. They use intravascular imaging. They select the patients very, very carefully. They use potent antiplatelet agents when they need to. And our current stent technology has really come to the point with thinner struts and uh, uh, really good polymers that we have really, really good results. And also you all, our referring physicians are doing such a great job on the patients with secondary prevention strategies, statins, blood pressure control, ACE, ARB, heart failure medications, and of course, SGLT2 inhibitors in diabetic patients. So when you look at all of this, you say to yourself, well, all of these things that have happened, if I want to give somebody a prolonged duration with a good, good amount of antiplatelet regimen, do I really need aspirin? Can I drop aspirin? Can I go to a single agent instead of dropping the, the P2I12 inhibitor, especially the potent one? because aspirin does have a, some really un, important uncertainties. There's direct gastrotoxicity with gastric bleeding. You all, if I ask you, all of you in the audience, I know you have had patients who have had aspirin-related GI bleeds. We now have novel antithrombotic regimens. We have the, the potent P2Y12 inhibitors, but we also have direct oral anticoagulants who are the, the DOAX and the factor 10A inhibitors that also have some uh, level of benefit. And you are doing a great job with the risk reduction, reduction strategies, making the use of an aspirin really only there to cause bleeding. Because if you look at the platelet activation mechanism, the P2Y12 um, a receptor has a major role in amplification of platelet activation with the interplay of other signaling pathways, including the glycoprotein 2B3A receptor. And so it's really important to think about the P2Y12 inhibitor here as the alternative, perhaps single antiplatelet regimen. And in fact, there are platelet uh, studies 
platelet function studies that have shown that as in presence of a P2Y12 receptor inhibitor that is potent, aspirin provides little additional benefit in platelet aggregation. So what evidence do we have around this? Well, the STOP-DAPT investigators just did this in Japan with the Zion stent, one month of DAPT followed by clopidogrel monotherapy compared to 12 months of DAPT in, in patients, um, all comers, stem, uh, STEMIs excluded. But here, what they did is they compared these two populations in 3,000 patients, 85% had IVIS. They showed a reduction in the net adverse clinical events, mostly driven by reducing bleeding. So death, MI, stroke, and stent thrombosis was similar. There was a reduction in Timmy major minor bleeding, but overall the, the benefit was in favor of dropping the aspirin at one month, and there was no ill effect by doing that. The smart choice investigators did three months of, of DAPT followed by P2Y12 monotherapy compared to DAPT for 12 months with three different stent platforms. Similarly, they showed no difference in the ischemic outcomes and a reduction in bleeding. And the global leader investigators looked at the, um, a, an experimental strategy of an all comers PCI population of 16,000 patients of aspirin plus ticagrelor for only one month, followed by ticagrelor monotherapy for 23 months, compared to the control arm that had multiple embedded comparisons for ACS, aspirin, ticagrelor for, for 12 months, followed by aspirin monotherapy in stable uh, patients, aspirin clopidogrel for 12 months, followed by aspirin monotherapy, the way we used to treat these patients. And what they showed, they went for a big, big, big um, opportunity to reduce DEF and Q-wave MI, and they just missed the endpoint uh, with a p-value of 0.073. So they just, just uh, nearly missed this endpoint. But honestly, take a look, all of the events, the ischemic events are in favor of this aspirin, um, dropping the aspirin at one month. This was open label, there was no US data, there was no adjudication, and the comparator arm had multiple embedded comparisons. And it was for this reasons, if you can think about it, we wanted to, and, and I have to say, give a lot of credit to Dr. Sharma, who was treating uh, patients um, with, at, uh, especially complex patients um, who were not, who were stable with uh, 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 Berlinta or uh, Ticagrelor. He was sending him home on Ticagrelor and he told me, he said, why don't we do a study like this? And so I went back to the drawing board and we designed the largest ever study in a double blind placebo controlled fashion, high risk PCI patients, three months of open label aspirin Ticagrelor. If they did well, no bleeding, no ischemic events and compliant on their medication, they were randomized to receive ticagrelor plus aspirin versus ticagrelor plus placebo for the next 12 months. And then we looked at their events, looking for a reduction in bleeding, in bleeding complications without increasing ischemic events. And guess what we found? Bark 235 bleeding. When you look at the, uh, the thing, it was a significant, huge reduction, 44% reduction of bleeding. Numbers needed to treat 33. So thank you, Dr. Sharma. It was a great, great idea. And in fact, you were completely correct that we would not see a change in the ischemic events of death, MI, or stroke. Nobody knew, knew these results. We were very, very scared. We had a very big data safety monitoring board, 187 sites, 11 countries, New England Journal of Medicine, fantastic study. We were very, very happy. And our investigators in Korea did a three months of... Um, DAPT followed by ticagrelor monotherapy compared to 12 months of ticagrelor and aspirin in an ACS patient population, including STEMI patients. And they found similarly a reduction in bleeding with no, no change in the ischemic events. NACE was significantly reduced, but very, very important study. Uh, only 3,000 patients, open label, but still corroborating the evidence that we found on Twilight. And as a result, in 2020 ESC guidelines, the ticagrelor monotherapy 
in ACS patients received a 2A indication as an alternative approach for those patients who tolerate the um, aspirin ticagrelor for three months. They can go on ticagrelor monotherapy if they didn't have any events of bleeding or ischemic events. And of course, a uh, meta-analysis uh, of all of these trials put together did show similarly that uh, bleeding was significantly reduced, no change in overall death, myocardial infarction, or stroke. So the truth is that the right therapy for the right patient is the way we have to go. One size doesn't fit all. If you have high ischemic risk, low bleeding risk, easy. Prolonging dual antiplatelet duration. If you have a high bleeding risk, and a low ischemic risk, shorten that duration. If you have a low ischemic risk and a low bleeding risk, we still need more data. We believe shorter is better, less is more. And if you have people who in whom you have both the high bleeding risk and a high ischemic risk, you might be considering ticagrelor monotherapy or P2Y12 monotherapy as a tailored approach. Now, quickly for the next five minutes, moving to the anticoagulants, here the plot thickens. A patient with AFib, we have to prevent stroke, we need oral anticoagulants. In stents, we have to prevent stent thrombosis and we need DAPT. You, can pay, come, you put those two together, DAPT plus, plus oral anticoagulant, guess what? You have a patient who will bleed. And the synergy is there, the anticoagulant and antiplatelet therapy. So here's where it would be a great place to drop aspirin. And in fact, the American perspective of what to do with the update is that the default strategy is, a, is one of dropping aspirin as soon as you can. Unless the patient is at a high ischemic risk, you should go up to a month, month of, uh, of triple therapy. But really for most patients, you wanna stop the, uh, uh, the aspirin as early as seven days, even sometimes at the time of discharge. And if you put it all together from all of the trials that have been done, with the NOAX plus single antiplatelet therapy versus VKA plus DAPT, what you're seeing is no difference in the stroke rates, if you, if you look at that, but a big, big reduction of the bleeding events. And you see that right here, that clinically significant bleeds are continuously reduced when you replace warfarin uh, with a no novel oral anticoagulant and you go from DAPT to a single antiplatelet therapy. The only place you see all the time we're seeing a reduction in bleeding, especially intracranial hemorrhage, but the one place where we get nervous is in those patients who might have uh, extra stent thrombosis still crosses the line of unity. So I wouldn't be too worried, but still you have to choose in certain patients to give them aspirin for a little bit of a longer period of time. So in conclusion, in patients with AF, undergoing PCI, no significant differences between novel oral anticoagulant and single antiplatelet and um, a VKA plus DAPT strategy in terms of MACE, but a major reduction in bleeding when you replace, you drop aspirin and you go to a novel oral anticoagulant. Thank you so much for your attention. We're gonna open this up now to some Q&A and I'm very, very happy to take any questions you might have. Okay, excellent overview. And I'm sure our audience will like it because you were exactly to the point which uh, I was hoping for and it's fantastic and uh, uh, clearly what uh, basically we learned for the year 2020 is besides what we learned about COVID-19 uh, pandemic is that go away from aspirin. Uh, <laughs> well, in some cases, one definitely. Trial, one trial in the valve therapy when they compare aspirin with aspirin plus uh, clopidogrel found aspirin good. So only one study aspirin positive, most of the trials have been aspirin negative. So with that note, they actually, we have a very nice note from uh, Dr. Samir Mehta that the trilite is transforming, transformative for PCI, not only in aspirin, out of stable PCI, I believe even for ACS, role is overstated. Now, I mean, that is true, but actually, if you think about the original trial with the stent thrombosis done, aspirin was used, remember aspirin, Aspirin, aspirin plus ticlopidine and aspirin plus coumadin. So they did, aspirin coumadin was the worst, but aspirin was evaluated in the early era of the bare metal stent. So I, the Roxana, you want to question comes is that aspirin became the main stay and now all of a sudden we think aspirin is bad. Where that thought process started? I mean, what was knowing that aspirin has inbuilt in our system 
people take aspirin even they have little risk factor or no risk factor diabetes or no diabetes everybody was taking aspirin where this idea is started that maybe we should attack the aspirin not reducing the dose of your dap to 3 months 6 months though many of those trials have been done so where this if you can just highlight you know comment on that the where this idea of taking away the aspirin i know the gi is the major issue on that but how who thought about it in the beginning well if, you know i wish i could take all the credit for it but you know way back when over a decade ago we had the capri study that we just kind of, kind of forgotten about Capri was in secondary prevention aspirin versus clopidogrel monotherapy aspirin monotherapy versus clopidogrel monotherapy and there clopidogrel um actually had less bleeding than aspirin and in fact the ischemic events were in in favor of clopidogrel but no one used it for uh just secondary prevention because it was um Plavix was expensive at that time uh, and uh people used aspirin instead So that is already there. There is some evidence already back then. And it was the first time that aspirin was dropped was in the Wust investigators that took the AFib patients from triple therapy and just made one change. They said, "Let's just send them home on warfarin and clopidogrel and drop the aspirin." 650 patients and they showed a 65% reduction in bleeding with actually a reduction in the ischemic events and a reduction in mortality it was like a, a a crazy study published in the lancet i remember reading the study in the in in it was presented at esc thinking this can't be true but it actually was but it gave us fuel to say maybe we should be looking at this then there were all these um studies that were being done with um with platelet function studies showing that in presence of a p2y12 uh inhibitor especially a potent one aspirin is doing nothing at all and you showed that in the platelet sub study of twilight dr sharma it absolutely it does nothing to blood thrombogenicity so with all of this evidence and then the year 2019 was a terrible year for aspirin all of their primary prevention stuff was showing nothing but increased bleeding and no ischemic benefit for primary prevention in seniors and diabetics in in people with just uh, low risk and it was like whoa what are we doing and we keep stacking therapies so and people are saying why don't we take away some therapies and see what happens and so it was really a brilliant uh, idea that you came up with dr sharma because you were using ticagrelor in stable coronary disease and you were telling me that in complex disease it would be important to see if we could get rid of aspirin and here we are beautiful now other question is about triple therapy in this covid-19 patients uh, uh, if they present with acute coronary syndrome knowing that uh, uh, the anticoagulation is routine uh, is there any recommendation for those patients that question asked by parasram yeah it's a very good uh, good question uh you know acute coronary syndromes we like to use the potent agents except in afib patients where uh, there's a class 3 indication in esc not to combine uh warfarin or novel oral anticoagulants with these potent agents because of bleeding so i think if they have a really low bleeding risk and you're very worried about a lot of thrombus and you put a bunch of stents you could probably give them like a low the the um no aspirin and go to like prasugrel or ticagrelor at the lower dose uh and uh give them um a a a novel oral anticoagulant but just remember in all of those big trials pioneer redual uh, augustus the use of prasugrel or ticagrelor was on no somewhere around 5% most of these patients received clopidogrel because the novel oral anticoagulant has some antiplatelet effect so you may not need to have that potent agent except to make it bleed I hope that makes sense. Yep, absolutely. And same thing we learned on the tower pa- trial patients also that if you using and no any anticoagulation uh, in AFib and tower that you just need only anticoagulation you don't need antiplatelet therapy. Of course patients who don't need any indication like they don't have CAD or anticoagulation alone is good enough. 